uh, hanging in there like a loose tooth. Heard that? All right, good to see everybody. Uh, still daylight out. I guess that's a good thing. I uh, want to continue to remember everyone on our list, uh, Edna Wyatt, Vaughn and Marceline Underwood, Sue Wheeler, Geraldine Yeager, Audrey Peed. Uh, did she come home or do you know? She did. She is home. Okay. Good, good news. Also, uh, Nancy Marshall and Rhonda Burtnett, uh, Aurelia Rogers. Uh, Lucille Watkins, Lucille's here. Uh, Alina Smith, Jerry Griffin. How's your brother doing? He's back. He is back home now, and doing pretty well. Okay, good. Uh, Juanita Griffin, Diane George, uh, Francis Turner, Connie Stacy. Uh, Mike said she's uh, just kind of confused about what day it is, but uh, anyway. Keep, keep her in your prayers. Martha Mullinex, anybody checked on Martha? She's getting better. Is she getting better? Okay. Tell her not to sleep with her feet hanging out the window. <laughs> uh, Steve Wilson, Will Hubbard, uh, Will doing okay? Good, glad to hear that. And then Steve's having surgery next week. Keep him in your prayers. Maria Martin, Eddie Partain. Also, um, Bonnie and Bill Wright, Teresa Anderson, uh, Jerry and Della Hill, Audrey Racine, and she did move last week. She is in South Carolina, so uh, keep Audrey in your prayers. Also, Colleen uh, Corrado, uh, and we have an address for her out on the foyer if you want to send a card or something, but... Uh, be sure to read the information on the card. Also, Mickey Pumphrey, don't know if he's had his surgery. And uh, Daniel put something about his cousin, Jason Hammond. Um, what I saw on the news is there was two construction workers that fell off of a 30-foot roof on a condo. And he was one of them. So uh, anyway, um, keep him in your prayers. Uh, Patsy Weaver, this is Sherry Dean's sister, and is she still in the hospital, Travis, or do you have any? She came home, I think this morning, and she's going back home tomorrow. Okay, she's going back to Texas? Okay. Keep her in your prayers. And then if you haven't heard, uh, William Smith, when, uh, known as Bill Smith, this is Nancy Marshall's uncle and Connie Stacy's brother, he passed away. He was at the DiversaCare up here. Been there since Thanksgiving, is that right? So uh, anyway, uh, keep uh, that family in your prayers. Uh, is anybody we need to add or take off our list? Anybody? Brother Bob, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be here tonight. We thank you for giving us another day to live in your wonderful beauty. Uh, we are in good health. We have a roof over our heads. We're well fed and clothed. We thank you for all the blessings of this life, Father. We're mindful that there are others who are not as good off as we are. We just heard a list of names of our own number who request our prayer. As at this time, Father, we remember each and every one of them. We ask that you take them up, wrap your loving arms around each and every one of them and bless them in only the way that you can. Let them know that you haven't forgotten them, that you're mindful of their injuries and their suffering, and that you won't <coughs> let them fall through the cracks. You've you got them in your, in your care. We thank you for allowing us this hour of Bible study. We pray that we're all attentive to the lesson that Brother Joel presents. 
We ask a blessing on everyone here. That every family is represented here. And when we leave this place, we have a safe trip to our boat. We thank you especially for your son Jesus who died for our sin and it's in his name. And we ask this prayer. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. I guess y'all want me to put this on. Okay. They probably do. Well, I'm not going to say it too loud, but we have figured out how to fool Facebook. Roy has. Roy and Roger have. Uh, what you'll see now, you won't see a recording of our services, but what you'll see is when you click on that page, it will take you to YouTube, and you don't have to do anything else. All you got to do, when you see a lesson on Facebook, just click on it, and it'll take you to the YouTube, which will show it. And uh, that, number one, it, it helps in the streaming, and, and when we talk about streaming, that means we're putting videos on two websites. Now we're only doing it on one, which uh, saves a lot of headache. Uh, so anyway, but I uh, just wanted to let you know, appreciate uh, Brother Roy working working through that, and uh, we are uh, still putting out the content uh, of our services. Um, the uh, lessons that uh, Brother Keith did uh, has gotten more views than my sermons. Anyway, no, he did a tremendous job on that, and I tell you what, I I knew he would do a good job, and that's that's why we had him do it. So anyway, we're trying to get as much content out there as possible, and uh, you know. So anyway, all right, we're in Revelation uh, chapter fifteen, and we've been over this a couple of times. But to help uh, those who have not been here. Uh, just over in chapter 13, we have the, the beast rising up out of the sea, the second beast rising up out of the earth. Uh, the beast speaks blasphemies. The second beast looks like a gentle lamb, but he speaks like the dragon. And what we said was that that is a reference to the Roman government. First beast being the emperors and the Roman government, the second beast would be the pagan priest that would set up the idols, forcing people to bow and worship the emperor uh, through these, these idols. And uh, they had power to, to throw people in prison, to punish them, to set up these uh, idols for all of the Roman Empire. And uh, the power was given to them. But when we see chapter 14, we see the Lamb of God standing on Mount Zion. A lot is said in that passage. Mount Zion is the spiritual mountain for Jerusalem. Uh, sometimes it is poetic for the church. Uh, it, it is where worship takes place. Uh, it is where the Lamb is standing uh, and the lamb that we have seen is though he has been slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, he has the 144,000 with him. And remember, not a literal number. It is a number that represents all of God's people who have suffered uh, at the hand of the Roman government and the uh, pagan priests that persecuted them. It represents all of those who were faithful and did not deny the Lord, uh, did not worship the beast. And so it, it, is a, it is a number of the complete redeemed. You, you just Again, the numbers uh, mean, have meaning in ancient writing, and it has meaning here. It's not just biblical. These numbers are not just biblical numbers. They are numbers that apply to all of ancient writing. They use these symbols. 
And so you got 144,000, 12,000 is a religious number representing 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. Uh, there is the 24 elders, but now here is 144,000, meaning a complete and full number. Uh, and it is a religious number, as we said. So the, these are the 144,000 that is with the Lamb. And so when we come to chapter 15, we have what we hear, what we have here uh, is, uh, let me get to my notes. It is an introduction to the bowls of wrath being poured out. Chapter 15, only eight verses long. And it, it deals with uh, the prelude, the building up. Now in the book of Revelation, there are probably seven or eight judgments. And these judgments in, in the far sense uh, are the a, a picture of God's judgment, the final judgment. Uh, when we look at the first century Christian and what they were facing, what they were being assured of is that they would suffer at the hands of these of the Roman Empire, but they would have victory in Christ. And that they, that they withstood the persecution of the Roman Empire and had not defiled themselves with pagan idolatry, uh, then God has their name written on their foreheads, identifying them. You also see that in those that worship the beast had their, uh, the, the mark of the beast written in their forehead and also in the palms of their hand. And of course, we talked about that where it says at the end of chapter 14, it's the end of chapter 13, one of those, that it is the number of a man. Uh, and not, not the number of the man or of a particular man, but what he's saying, it's man's number. Man's number is six, uh, is six but here he says 666. Six, six. And the concept is, the meaning is, no matter how many sixes you put with it, it's still incomplete. Seven is complete. Uh, when you see the seven seals, seven, the lamb is opening up the seven seals, chapter five, chapter six. When you see the, the plagues uh, that are poured out, there are seven plagues that come from God being poured out upon the enemies of the church, poured out upon those who persecuted God's people, poured out upon the Roman government and the paganism. And then here, seven bowls. And the, the seven bowls is God's complete wrath. And so it, it's not, or these are really not different events, but they are events that are being told in a different way. It's the same event being told in a different way in the fact is that though the beast and the, the second beast and the pagan priest and Rome and all those persecuted God's people, judgment is coming to them. Now they were allowed to persecute God's people 42 months and you'll see that, you'll see three and a half years, you'll see 42 months, you'll have 1,200 and 60 days. That all represents, 1260 is 42 months, it is three and a half years. And it is half of seven, which means that the punishment or, or the, the persecution of Rome towards Christians is a limited period of time. And when you contrast the the persecution of God's people versus the torment of the beast and the second beast and those that worshiped it, their torment will last forever and forever. And so it is no end to that persecution. So 
uh, in chapter 6, and I'm just going to write these, these right here, and you can look up these later. But in Revelation chapter 6, probably 12 through 17 is one, one of these judgments. Uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11 and verse number 15 through 19 is a second judgment or a second picture of the judgment. And then chapter 14, 14 through uh, 20 is another. So up until this time, we have three judgments upon them, and now here comes the fourth judgment in chapter 16. The fourth judgment is coming uh, against Rome. So when you start comparing these, uh, when you look at the, the trumpet and the seals, the, the trumpet is what announced the the wrath of God being poured out. Uh, it is, it, in, in comparison, it is the same as the bowl. First of all, it's poured up, out upon the earth, and then it's poured out upon the sea, and then it's poured out upon the rivers, and then it's poured out upon the sun, and it's poured out upon the abyss, or the, the throne of the beast. It's poured out upon the Euphrates, and then, of course, there is a final ending of that, and that's the uh, concept of that. So in Revelation chapter 15 verse 1, there what we see is the angels of God are awaiting instruction. Notice what it says. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is, what does it say? Complete. This is going to be, in the far picture, it's going to be the judgment of God. It's going to be the final judgment. It's the final judgment seen in reference to this, these beasts, uh, to the Roman government and to the beast. So you have these angels that are awaiting verse number one. He says uh, that he saw a sign, and this word sign is not really the word miracle as sometimes it has, can be interpreted, but it literally means a wonder. It's something that, that is, is a wonder as they look at it. He's, uh, it is the attention that is being given uh, to that. And he says, in great and marvelous seven angels, remember the number seven. Now, when we look at the book of Thessalon, uh, first. Is it 2 Thessalonians, where the Lord will come in flaming fire with his angels? It's more than seven angels, but the seven here is the representation of the complete judgment being poured out. Remember, this is a book of symbols and signs. And so as, as we are looking, here is the complete judgment. These angels will administer this uh, punishment and wrath upon uh, the Rome and upon uh, those and will be uh, also to the ultimate end that is the judgment of that. So you have these angels and they're awaiting God's destruction. And then from verse 2, 3, and 4, what you have is the victorious saints. Now, they're singing before God pours this wrath out on them, on, on the beast, upon Rome, upon the wicked, upon those who torture God's people. This, these saints, notice what it's saying. He says, and I saw something like a sea of glass. Now, sea of glass or glass generally represents serenity and peace. Uh, have you ever been out to the Gulf of Mexico uh, in probably in the winter months? when the wind is blowing from the north and the, and the gulf is just almost flat. It, it is very peaceful in looking at it, especially in the mornings and in the evening. It's very peaceful. It's not like in the summertime when you have a full moon and the tide is coming in. Uh, it is very flat. So the concept here is that here is peace, but it's mingled with fire. 
Now, fire is a purifying agent. Peter talked about how that we as Christians were tried by fire. Uh, when, you, when you take gold and you put fire to it and you burn the impurities off, you know, you have uh, 10 karat gold is, has more impurities than 14 karat gold. And when you put it through the test, you burn off all the impurities of it. These Christians has, have gone through fire, but they have peace. And, and not only that, this fire also can represent what is about to happen to the enemies of the church, to the enemies of God's people. And so he says, mingled with fire who have the victory over the beast and over the image and over the, his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. A lot is being said here. Number one, it says here that they have victory over the beast. Now, how is that? How can they have victory over the beast? Because in chapter six and seven, what did we see those saints? Where did we see them? They were under the altar and they had been beheaded. So how is it that they have victory? Through Christ. In fact, that's what it says. And that you says at the end of 13 and probably end of 14 that they have this victory because of the blood of Christ. It is the blood of Christ that will redeem them. It is the blood of Christ that gives them victory. It is the blood of Christ that gives us victory. It is the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. Back over in Revelation 1 and verse 5, uh, it talks about how that we have been washed from our sins in his own blood. It is the blood of Christ that looses us or washes us from our sins through the obedience of baptism. And so he's saying, they're saying here that they have victory over the beast. They have lost their lives. They have been beheaded. They have been tortured. They have been murdered. They have been killed. They have been drugged through the street. Um, some of the, some of the uh, saints that we have, uh, we have a man by the name of Polycarp. I've probably heard me say this before, but Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. And Polycarp was fighting uh, what they call Gnosticism, and Brother Israel and I talk about Gnosticism all the time, which denies that Jesus is the Son of God. And so there was this great Gnostic that had, well, he was a leader in the Gnostic community, and he came into the bathhouse where Polycarp came in, where Polycarp was. And Polycarp, in a joke, ran out screaming, the, you know, the world is coming to an end, the world is coming to an end. But it, was, it was, shows the battle of, of the Christians against not only Rome, but also against fellow Jewish countrymen who denied that Jesus was the Son of God. So you have Roman government fighting Christians. You have the pagan priest who instituted these idols and they were going after Christians. You also had the common person. And we mentioned this, how that they believe that because of a storm or a fire or some natural disaster, that it was the Christian's fault because they would not worship the emperor. And so you had that. And then now you have the Jewish Christians or Jewish uh, people who persecuted Christians because they did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, that part began to fade out in history of the, of the Jewish persecution against Christians. But as it faded out, the Roman persecution began to step up. And, uh, you know, it was in God's plan to redeem mankind uh, to spread the gospel. It was the Jewish persecution that got... Christians out of Jerusalem. They were, they were satisfied to stay there. 
until you had a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus in Acts, or, or, uh, Acts chapter 7 at the end where Stephen was uh, murdered and stoned there. And then Saul began to persecute Christians and Christians began to scatter. And they go into Samaria and then they go into uh, other regions of the world. And so it was Jewish persecution that got Christians out of Jerusalem. It was Roman persecution that pushed them to the rest of the world. Because when they went, they, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, they went everywhere preaching the word. They just weren't running from persecution. Persecution. They went teaching and preaching the gospel. So when you, you know, Paul or Saul of Tarsus went to Damascus, which is 140 miles from Jerusalem, to persecute Christians. And so it, he just kind of pushed pushed them into the other regions of the world. And then Rome got involved and began to persecute. So anyway, the ones that the Christians who were victorious because of the blood of Christ, who has the victory over the beast and over the image and over the, his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now, this is not a passage that says we, that there are going to be harps in heaven. Remember, this is figurative. What do people who played the harps, what did they do? They sang along with that, didn't they? David was called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He played the harp, but he also wrote the psalms that we read of at least half of the Psalms in, in the book of Psalms. And so they were, they were songs that were devoted to God. They were songs of victory. They were songs of, of joy, of going to the tabernacle. Uh, Psalm 23, the, the comforting song that the Lord is my shepherd. Those were written by David and many times put to with a harp. But it's not, the emphasis is not on the harp. The emphasis on that they are singing. This is the song of victory. Notice what it says. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now, do we sing a song like that, Brother Sewell? Yes, we do. So what does, what is the song of Moses? In Exodus chapter 15, when the children of Israel had crossed over the Jordan, uh, crossed over the Red Sea, the Egyptians followed after them. They got to the other side, and as they were in the sea, God collapsed the, uh, the waves over the Egyptians and wiped them out, wiped out the enemies of God. So it, was a, it is a song of deliverance. In the days of Moses, the song of Moses was the song of deliverance. And now these Christians are with the Lamb and they are with him. They are standing on this sea of glass that is mingled with fire and they have victory over the beast. What are they singing? Song of deliverance. Look at just for a minute, just let's go back to the book of Revelation and remember what we said concerning the book, I'm, I'm sorry, the book of Exodus. You're already in Revelation. Um, in the book of Exodus chapter 15, we're just going to read just a few verses, but I want you to get the poetic uh, sense uh, of this and what is being said. Now remember they had been come to uh, they had come to the Red Sea. The, the Egyptians were coming from the rear. They had the Red Sea in front of them. They were terrified. And Moses said, stand still and see, uh, see the work of the Lord. So in uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 1, then Moses and the children of Israel, this is after they crossed over the sea, uh, sang this, this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. 
He is my God and I will praise him, my Father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. You can go through and read the rest of it. But how poetic is that? And it says they sang the song of Moses. Did, has that, was that song written before this happened? No. They sang this by inspiration. And they sang that God was glorious. And so when you look at the poetry of the Old Testament, here they are magnifying God and placing him. And so we see um, that here is the song of deliverance. And so the Christians uh, in the first century are singing this song of deliverance. They had been murdered. They had been beheaded. They had been tortured. They had been put to death. But yet they have victory. Because now they are with the Lamb. Now they are victorious. They are victorious over the beast and over the second beast. They're victorious over the torture and the persecution. And so as they are there, this is a building up that the bowls of wrath have not been poured out and yet they are singing concerning the deliverance that God has given them. They, were, they had come forth they had been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and they were victorious in that. That's chapter 14 uh, uh, of that. And so he says that they were victorious and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God almighty. This is a term given to God. Lord is um, the American standard and maybe the revised standard translates the word Lord as Jehovah, Yahweh, which has to do with his saving power. But the word God is Elohim and it has to do with his creative power. And almighty God has to do with his complete authority. The beast cannot be victorious over the lamb. The beast cannot be victorious over all of those who are faithful to and did not fall to the worship of these um, pagan gods. Verse number, the rest of verse number three, or is that three? Or no, that's, uh, yeah, three. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgment has been manifested. So here are these Christians singing this song of deliverance. The beast has been cast in chapter, is it chapter 14, has been cast and they're tor into hell. Their torment is forever and forever. The fact is that these Christians have victorious, although they lost their life on this earth, they did not lose their eternal life. And uh, although the Lamb of God was taken and slain, he's victorious when he comes out of the grave and uh, those that are faithful to him. Verse number five, and after these things I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. The temple of the tabernacle. Well, the tabernacle of the Old Testament was a place of worship. Uh, and the temple in the uh, New Testament or Old Testament also was also a place of worship. But when he says the temple of the tabernacle He's talking about the inner sanction. He's talking about the holy of holies. Who was allowed to go into the holy of holies in the Old Testament? The high priest. 
one time a year. What was inside there? There was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was where the mercy seat was. On top of the, the Ark, you had two cherubims. Their wings, would they faced each other and their wings would touch. And the mercy seat was right above where their wings. So what was so important about the mercy seat? That's where the blood was taken from the, the altar from the, on the Day of Atonement, taken from there and placed on the mercy seat. And it was the blood of the animals. But when Christ, in Hebrews chapter 8 and 9, when he entered into the holy place, what did he take? His blood. And of course, it was the blood to redeem mankind. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, but they had to offer that animal every year in order to do that, that God's judgment would be appeased. There was this, this lamb, this oxen, this uh, goat. Sometimes it was different, different animals. Yes. The scapegoat, two goats. Scapegoat, take your, take your hands, lay your hands on the head of the goat. What was that about? Transferring sin and taking it and pushing it out of the camp. And then the other goat, what was done with them? It went to the altar and it was slain and the blood was spilled. The blood placed on the horns of the altar the animal was sacrificed. That was the sacrifice to God. One instance on the Day of Atonement was to push the sins away from the camp, away from the Israel. It was, it was laying your hands upon that goat. And then, of course, the other goat was taken and slain, and it was a sacrifice. And by the way, in putting their hands on the goat or any animal that they offered, it was an admission of guilt, an admission of guilt. You placed your hands on that animal, and then, of course, that was the admission that you had sinned, and that, that animal was going to bear that burden uh, until the true sacrifice would come. And so that animal was slain and was put to the altar. But the, the idea is that here the Christians um, are, are what John is seeing is the temple of the tabernacle. In other words, where is the temple? Where is the tabernacle? It's in heaven. Where, do, where is God? And by the way, when you read the book of Revelation, you start looking, heaven is, is described as the tabernacle of God. There's no outside streets. There's no shopping malls over here. There's no, no other place. It is the tabernacle is the in, embodiment of heaven. So the idea is that here's God. And who is before God? What did we see in chapter 4? What did we see in chapter 5? What did we see in chapter 6 and chapter 7? We saw people standing around the throne of God worshiping God and the Christ. That's what we saw. Where were they? In heaven. So if you don't like going to church, you ain't going to like going to heaven. Right? Because it's a place of worship. It's a place of service. Now listen, I, I'm, I can't carry a tune in a bucket, but there's going to be a lot of singing up there there's going to be a lot of praise. And that's not the only thing we're going to... We're not going to be up there twiddling our thumbs for half of eternity and then twiddling back the other way for the other half. The Bible says in, in uh, chapter 7, I think it's verse 12, his servants shall serve him. Well, wait a minute, Lord. I got sleep apnea and I've been up all night and I'm about to fall asleep. That ain't going to happen. Lord, I got, a, I got a knee replacement. I can't do much. Oh, that's going to be gone. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, tells us that God will give us a body that will last for an eternity. 
the Revelation 21 and 22 says, there is no pain, no sorrow, no tears, no death, no crying. I'm ready, are you? <laughs> I mean, I'm not getting a busload tonight, but I am saying this. Heaven is, is the place where we're going to be surrounded by the angels of God. We're going to be in the presence of God. We're going to be surrounded by fellow Christians throughout all time and throughout all generations. Worshiping and rejoicing. So, uh, and, and when he says his servants shall serve him, I don't know exactly what we're going to be doing, but we ain't going to be sitting around. God made us to work. And we get satisfaction out of work. When we complete something that's worthwhile, we get satisfaction out of that. All right? Okay, so in verse number uh, six, and out of the temple came seven angels. Out of the temple, all right? So here, it, and also it is the reference if Christ brought his blood to the Holy of Holies before God in heaven, where is God? Out of the uh, tabernacle or out of the temple came seven angels having seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen. Now, linen was the garment of the priest. And this linen is made from flax. It's not made from cotton. I used to think all, all linen was made out of cotton, but, and I guess it is in today. But this, they had a way to make out of flax, they could make a pure white garment. And it was, it represents a purity. When the priest when he, when he wore his robe, he also wore not only linen clothing, he also says linen breeches. I now know where the word breeches comes from. Uh, but, but long pants. And it, it was there for, for a purpose. They, a priest, when he came to the temple or the tabernacle to serve, he had to wash his hands, his feet, his face. He had to change his garments. He could not wear his house clothes or everyday clothes into the tabernacle or into the temple. He could not wear them. He had to change into the right garment. And he had to present himself in a, a manner of purifying. Yes, Elaine. Yes. That was one of the things that okay. they were not allowed to sweat. Okay. That's become defiled, but the air could move because they were heavy armor. They did. So, they did. All the, 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 the could not look upon the nakedness of that priest. That's right. When he climbed into, when he went to the altar and he climbed up those steps, uh, he had to have his clothing tied off and also linen breeches so they couldn't look upon his nakedness. So, but it, the point is that we, there's purification, there is righteousness. Here are the, the, the uh, angels who come out and they have seven plagues and they're glo uh, clothed in pure bright linen. White, is, and I said it last week or last time we met, white is the color of heaven. Now somebody says, what about the straight of gold? Well, yeah, you got a straight of gold. But we, the, the saints that have been purified are arrayed in white. Um, it, and it, because it represents righteousness and purity. And uh, so anyway. All right, well, we run out of time. So we'll just uh, put a mark right there at verse number seven. And we will take up next week at this place.
Appreciate the opportunity to do the invitation tonight. I want to continue on a little bit of follow-up add to the lesson on uh, Hebrews 10.25 that we had here about oh, three or four weeks ago, maybe. I can't remember. I'm getting old. <laughs> but I uh, want to follow up on that a little bit. Uh, the Hebrew writer says not to forsake the assembly. That, that, that leaves out everything else. We need to be here, brethren, if health permits. To be here at the worship service, to exhort and provoke each other to live righteously and to encourage one another that we stay faithful and true to the Word of God. And i got the remedy here tonight is how we can do that. And certainly, if you want to, turn to Galatians 6 and 1. There's our remedy. And we'll look at that. But also, if you would, take your songbook and turn to number 597. And, and that one right there is, is a position we don't want to be in when we meet our Lord in the judgment. Not meet Him empty-handed. We want to meet Him at least with our soul in our hand. And you better worry about the one talent man, you know, that got his talent and did nothing with it. The Lord didn't like that too much when he showed up with nothing. And he took what he had and gave it to the other man. So, that song right there is, is, is one of the most sobering songs that I believe you can sing. Meet the Lord in the day of judgment with nothing in your hand. No, not one soul. At least we can go with our soul and pray for mercy. Surely we can take somebody with us. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. He tells us to, uh, he said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault or any trespass, as American Standard said, ye which are spiritual. Now that's the faith. He's, the, those of us that are, are faithful in everything that we can possibly be in to the work of the church and to the Lord. Everything that he requires. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, brethren, we, we, we know, most of us do, and I know I'm talking to the brethren that are doing everything that they can and are faithful and true, and we, we need to be careful that we don't overlook some good work that we can be doing. Because 
We need to go to those that we know that have not been faithful and be kind and gentle and talk with them and see if we can help them get themselves restored back to the Lord and to the church. If we don't, brethren, who else is going to go? The outside world is not going to go because they're not interested in the church. They're interested in their own things. So it's up to you and I to try to help the brethren in the church. We need each other and we need to encourage and strengthen one another that we can all be faithful and true to our Lord and Savior. James in James 4.17 tells us, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now would it be good if I encourage one of my brethren that is not faithful or is weak? We have a lot of people that you can get them restored and then two or three weeks later they slip back. And that's what happens when you get used to being absent from the worship service. Now this pandemic comes through, and let me tell you, it's going to be a setback to the Lord's church for the years to come because many are going to be satisfied in just sitting at home, doing nothing. I don't know if you want to call that laziness, or you would want to call it some of that would be laziness. Some would be just not knowing not having studied enough, not been in Bible class to learn what the Lord wants us to do. Even our bulletin tells us that even though we're service and we've done all that the God has required of us, we're unprofitable. Rather, we can't overdo it. We need to do the best we can while we're here in this life. And I'm telling you, I'm over there way up on the other side of life. And I don't have long to get anything done. My eyesight's failing me and it won't be long before I can't see anything out of this right eye. And uh, Dixon Bible is drawing up. And I'm going to try to be able to read it the last day I'm in this world. But uh, that is your remedy right there. The brethren needed to be exhorted. And they to keep them from falling away. And going back under the old law. Paul was having time trying to get the brethren to remain faithful. And they were being persecuted. In other situations, it was not working well with them. So they could get discouraged. You and I get that way sometimes. But brethren, the Lord went to that cross, Hebrews 12 and 2, and He counted it joy to go there and die for you and I. Because he knew that the preaching of the gospel, we could have our sins forgiven and the saving of our soul. The Lord counted it a great joy to die for you and I. Now you think about it. And then here I am out here in good health and I can't get down to the services. My health's good. I'm not down here to encourage you within certainly... uh, you need to be encouraged. You need to be exhorted. I need it. We need to fellowship, brethren. God's people need to stay together in order to remain faithful and true and make it to heaven. If we don't, brethren. We can't ignore our brethren. We can't leave them when they need our help. The Lord told them in Matthew 25, I was sick. You didn't help me. I was thirsty. You offered me no drink. I was hungry. You gave me nothing to eat. I was naked. You didn't clothe me. Why? You see, we've got some things that we, we're pretty good at. What the Lord has said don't do, we're good at that. We don't do it. We don't get in that trouble. But the things He said do, exhort and encourage and fellowship one another, we let that slide. And that causes us to be weaker. That, just, that causes us to not have that zeal to go out here and try to evangelize this community. Oh, we get to, thou shall not do this, that, and other. We get that. Oh, we tend to that. But, what about exhorting the brethren? What about calling on the widow 
and checking on her condition or the orphan to see if we can help them. What about calling on that brother that's missed two or three services? See if we can help him and save a soul from a devil's hell. And that's an awful place, brother. And let me tell you, it's final when you leave this world. You're not going to change a thing in this world on that other side of death. That's the Lord's business over there. And no man, I don't care who he is, in this world or who has ever been in this world will change one thing on the other side of death. That's the Lord's business. And he knows what he wants. And he wants you and I to help one another. And let the world see us doing that. And it will cause people to want to join in with us to worship the Lord and walk with Him. Just think about it for a minute. We get there and we'd be like the one talent man and we don't even have our own soul to offer the Lord. What a pitiful position we're going to be in in that day. We can't do that, brethren. When He's given us the remedy to avoid that and how to serve Him and walk with the Lord, walk in that light with Jesus. He's added us to His church and to the kingdom, one and the same. We need to walk with Him that His blood will continue to cleanse us from those sins we commit through ignorance and what have you. We can repent and get back in His good graces. That's what God wants. And when we willfully sin, we can repent of that and come back and ask God to forgive us and He says He will in verse 9. 1 John 1 and 9. There's your remedy. You can come back home and get back in His good graces and walk with Jesus in that light. The light of His Word, the, the precious Word, brethren, will lead us just like God wants us to go if we'll just walk in it and be faithful and true to it. It's something to think about as you get older. <clears throat> Your time is running out. Have I done what I can? <clears throat> Brother Sewell said some kind words about me there. Last Lord's Day about working on these lights. Well, it's a joy to me to be able to do it. Lord give me the breath of life. He's given me the health. He's given me the strength and the know-how to do it. I can do that. Church won't have to hire it done. Take that and use it for mission work. Try to save a soul over yonder at a mission point that we've got overseas somewhere. Or maybe in this country. Help a preacher to stay in a place so he can preach the Word of God. James a lot of them call it the gospel of common sense. He just lays it on the line, brother. You can't, you can't uh, not do something. Faith without works is just dead. There's no, there's no hope there. You got to do something. You can't just slide by. It's, that's not going to work with God. When we become a member of the Lord's church, He expects you and I to begin to get out here and try to save souls. We've got to go into all the world and preach that gospel, Matthew 16, I mean 18. Go preach that gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15 and 16. We've got a job. The Lord has told us what He wants. Who's going to save us from the devil's hell? The Lord. The Heavenly Father. The prodigal son come back home. God welcomed him back because he repented. Confessed his sins. And he was welcomed back home. I don't care how far you get from God. If you hadn't rebelled altogether and got yourself in such shape that God won't take you back. You can come home. I can come home if I get out there. I can come back to God and confess my sins and that's what we need to do, brethren, when we commit one. Confess it to God and ask for His mercy and forgiveness and He'll do it. He loves us. 
He made this plan way before we ever came into this world to save us from our sins. Moses and the people under his day, they couldn't get the forgiveness of their sins in that day. They, they as I like to put it, they just paid the installment from year to year to year until Christ come and his blood washed them sins away. But they didn't get salvation like we got. Here we have the most beautiful hope of a place called heaven that anybody could ever desire. And people go around here and they try to find some way to make more money or to play some games over here or go over yonder and tour and whatever and fish and hunt and all this stuff and let the Lord's work go lay in. Now if we're members of the church, brethren, we can't do that. We're going we're gonna to be required to do His work. Even though we do all we can do, Luke 17.10 says we're unprofitable servants. After what God has done for us, we can't ever overpay Him. There's no way. Faith without works is dead, James says. 2.26 And certainly, some people say all you got to do is just oh, Pray the Lord's Prayer and then just sit down. You're saved. No, you don't find that in the Bible anywhere. You don't find you can go get a priest to pray for you and then uh, you give him some money and take care of your sins. No, you don't find that either. We don't need a priest. We've got one, the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, has got all kind of remedies for your soul's salvation, but brethren, there's not a man in this world that's got a dime's of authority beyond death. He's going there too. The devil's over there and he can't do anything. Hell is made for the devil and his angels. We don't want anything to do with that place. So let me encourage you to do this. We have a visitation program on Sunday night. We hand out names of those that are sick, shut in, they might need some help, some of them. Think about coming down and taking one of those and, and make a call or a visit. And you, you men and ladies, husband and wives, let me suggest that you look around and you decide that you're going to go out and visit brother, sister, so-and-so and see if you can get them to come back and repent and get back into church. Or maybe you've got some friends out there you would like to go talk to. Or maybe you could go over and talk and visit with some of the widows and check on them and see if they have any needs. Call the sick and see if you can help them. Maybe you can be of a service unto them. Brother, we need each other if we're going to make it home. we got to be encouraged and we're the only ones that can do it. God expects you and I to take care of his work here in Foley and do as much mission work as we can throughout the whole world. And it's our job. We can't just let it go undone. All we know how to not commit murder and robbery and all of this. But are we doing what he said do every day? The little things we can do, just a cup of water. Maybe help somebody that's hungry. Somebody that's sick. Somebody that needs a bed. Somebody that needs some clothing. We can't ignore that stuff, brethren. We got to help one another if we're God's children. And that's what He wants us to do. And it brings glory to Him. So let me encourage you to do what we can. I know that that pandemic has, has dealt with church a blow like we've never I don't know of anybody and I told the rest of the elders I don't know of anybody we could consult about something like this I don't know that any of the other brethren have ever run into anything like this in our day and time the government had us and the law the situation where we had to figure out what we could do and try to get things back to the worship where we ought to be where God would have us to be especially on the Lord's day in remembrance of his death. 
And so certainly, the church has had a setback due to this sickness. And it looks like the stuff is going to continue from now on till eternity. I don't know. Uh, I just pray none of us get it. I don't need it. I don't want it. But think of some things that you can do to build up the church, strengthen, edify, encourage one another. I had some men that encouraged me when I obeyed the gospel. And certainly, Brother Roger Potter's daddy was one of them. Brother Sheila Potter. Brother Shirley Huffman. Brother Patton Aurel. Brother and Sister Godwin. Oh, what, what jewels they were. I mean, some fine people. Without them, I wouldn't be here tonight. They encouraged me and were a great help to me in obeying the gospel and then trying to get in, with, as I say, with both feet and get going and get to work. And I've never looked back. Don't intend to. And I hope the Lord can find me one day that when my life breath comes, I'll have a big garden out there going and I'll have me a job doing something. I don't care what it is. I can do just about anything I want to. And uh, it may take me a little longer to get it done than I used to, but I can, I can still work on it. But brethren, we need to help one another and strengthen one another. Think about what I've said, you young people. Encourage somebody. All of you that are my age, do what you can. If you, if you can't do anything, else, pick up the phone and call somebody that is in worse shape than you are and see if you can help them, strengthen them. We need one another. The brethren out there that are not faithful, they need us to help them get restored. It can be done. We need to go to them and see what we can do. Because if we don't go, brethren, nobody else is going. The world out there is not interested in that. They're not going to bother with it. So it's up to you and I. I know most of you here have heard the word, Romans 10, 17. You must believe it, Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith it's impossible to please God. Luke 13 and 3 says we need to repent of our sins. And certainly all of us have sinned. There's no perfect person in this world other than the Lord. And then we need to confess the name of Christ before men that He'll confess us before His Father in heaven. I want to hear the Lord tell the heavenly Father, He's mine. If I belong to the Lord, going home one day and there's going to be some rest over there, brother. There's a place of rest over there like we can't understand. I can't comprehend it myself. I have no way of understanding anything that deep and beautiful. It's beautiful. Beyond beautiful. And be, then be baptized for the remission of your sins. That they'll be washed away. And God will not have them in His remembrance anymore. Acts 2.38 And then anchor yourself to the Word of God and walk with Jesus in it every day. And let His blood continue to cleanse you as one of His children. Then you'll be heaven bound. You'll be on the right road and there's nobody except you that can pull you off of that road. You've got to do it to yourself to miss heaven. The opportunity is right there. If you need to come, won't you come tonight while we stand in shame?
Good to see everybody tonight. Appreciate uh, your presence as always. I know that each one of us has been strengthened and edified and built up and have been here tonight, both on the Bible passage and the message that Brother Dallas brought us a few minutes ago. To work and to do everything we can for uh, the cause of Christ in, in our area. Wanted to uh, mention those on the sick list first of all uh, Bonnie Morrison Underwood, Maria Martin, Sue Wheeler. Juanita Chanel, Rhonda Burnett, Nancy Marshall, Bonnie Wright, Alina Smith, Diane George, Eddie Partain, Jerry and Della Hill, Jerry Griffin, Colleen Parada, and we've got a, a, a note or card out on the bulletin board uh, with her address. She lives in uh, Virginia, so if anybody could uh, send her a card or a note, uh, that would be appreciated. Steve Wilson, Connie Stacy, Francis Turner, Martha Mullinex, Mickey Pumphrey, and the Lord uh, was saying earlier that uh, Mickey's surgery has been scheduled. It'll be August the 24th. This will be at Providence Hospital in uh, Mobile. So let's remember Mickey is uh, is he has a uh, uh, heart surgery in uh, about another month. So we hope everything will go well uh, for him. Audrey P. She's still in the hospital. She's home. She's home. <clears throat> All this home, and so that's good news. And uh, uh, Geraldine Yeager is on the sick list as well. So let's remember all of these and, uh, and do what we can for them, encourage them in some way. Even those that uh, we can either drop a note uh, by or give, give a call. Uh, birthdays uh, for the rest of the week uh, Amos Dean, tomorrow the 15th. Nancy Marshall, Saturday the 19th. Vaughn and Marshall have their uh, anniversary tomorrow the 15th as well. So uh, remember all these and hope everything goes well uh, with all of these. The July Fellowship Bill will be uh, July the 29th at noon at uh, Craver's Seafood Restaurant in uh, Daphne. Uh, this is at the corner of 181 and 64 and a, a sign up sheet in the foyer. So if you plan on going, uh, sign that sheet when you can, uh, so Roy uh, will know how many to tell us to plan for. We're uh, sad to announce the funeral uh, or the death of uh, William Smith, who died uh, yesterday. Uh, the arrangements for the funeral are pending. Uh, this is Connie Stacy's brother and Nancy Marshall's uncle. So remember uh, that family or those families uh, in your prayers. Uh, as well as they grieve over the loss of their loved one. The pantry item this week is pork and beans. And that's all I have. <clears throat> some of you may be familiar with Craver's location and some of you may not. It's not exactly on the corner. When you get to the intersection of 181, that's the road that goes north and south, and 64 is running east and west. On the southwest corner is a Lakers farmer market. And right behind that, on the west side of the road, just below that, is where Kravers is located. So you've got one building that faces 64, but you've got to turn left whatever direction you go. Just keep in mind that Kravers is just right behind a Lakers. And you get up. Our closing song is number 22. We'll sing the first and the last verse of that song. And then uh, after we've done that, uh, only a Wyatt will lead us in our closing prayer. We invite you to stand as we sing these two verses. Stay with me, Lord, I cannot Be with me. 
study your word and heavenly father um, thank you for your only son jesus that died on the cross for a mission of our sin heavenly father thank you for all the many other blessings that you continue to shower upon us 